Our house is on fire. You are going to lose London, parts of New York. Global warming is the apocalypse. Seven years, 101 days left in this critical time window. From an apocalyptic phenomenon called hot house earth. It is worse, much worse than you think. Thank you for being here. You might be wondering, if climate change is real and we're all doomed to die, then why do anything about it? Though, if you're here, you at least recognize that climate change is real. Cool. Except it's not cool. It's actually hot. Hot as in 2 degrees Celsius hot, 35.6 degrees Fahrenheit hot. Hot like little Nas's lap dance with Satan hot, except it's not that fun. <laughs> okay, but seriously, we know the climate crisis is one of the most pressing issues we face today. A climate apocalypse encourages a YOLO mindset where we all gonna die anyway because the world is falling apart. So this narrative causes a nihilistic behavior where we panic and put ourselves first. A bunch of losers! Ah! Ah! Mm. The climate apocalypse mentality only drives more consumption. Look at what happened when the COVID pandemic began. Everyone started panic buying. But we cannot consume our way to a livable climate future. To meet the climate crisis head on, we have to change the narrative on our relationship with mother nature. The question is, who are we going to trust as our knowledge broker for a new narrative? A knowledge broker, educate us. A knowledge broker is exactly that, someone who breaks the knowledge down for you. Here's the problem. Often the biggest knowledge brokers in today's media landscape are economically privileged. They live at a comfortable and safe distance from climate disaster and everyday hardship, and they don't have to get their hands dirty in order to survive. It's no surprise that a lot of these knowledge brokers frame the climate debate as a binary. A false binary that says either we all have to achieve zero waste perfection or corporations and governments have all the power while we have none. Either approach is doomed to fail. This binary contributes to thoughts like, am I a bad person for eating meat? No! Am I a bad person for using plastic? No! The shame we experience when we can't achieve perfection freezes us into inaction. No wonder we all have eco-anxiety, and eco-anxiety makes us act out of fear. Can you be sustainable and use an iPhone? I think yes, as long as we remain a culture where overconsumption is built into ways in which products are made, if you're going with a secondhand version of something, you're somewhat stepping out of that system of consume, 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 and ultimately, that's a good thing. Since the climate binary says do it all or do nothing, most people choose to do nothing while criticizing others for imperfect action. That's why we're here, because we don't believe either is entirely true. We believe it's actually all of the above. Right. In the beginning of the sustainability movement, we were shamed for using plastic straws. And now the messaging is 100 companies are responsible for 71% of the world's greenhouse gases, which makes our actions seem insignificant. Let's bridge the gap between these two extremes. Clean tap water is not always an option. When you're choosing bottled water, choose one that's good for you and good for the planet. Ever and Ever is the first single-use aluminum water bottle. Aluminum is infinitely recyclable. These cans go from the recycling bin to the shelves within 60 days. Cheers. Cheers. Binaries are a colonial construct. Nature is non-binary. Climate is non-binary. Binary thinking actually limits the possibilities for a visionary and radical future. And it's up to us to reimagine the alternative and not just to protest against them and expect them to do better. Binary thinking suffocates our hope while feeding the fear instead of fueling our actions. Cameron Brick, a professor of social psychology at the University of Amsterdam says, this doom and gloom perspective is actually dangerous. She says, if you paint it as a terrible tragedy, people either turn away from it or internalize it and feel despair and then disengage. The fascinating thing is that a lot of communities on the front lines of the climate crisis do not have the same doom and gloom narrative. They can't afford to because they have to constantly respond to impacts and disasters on the climate front lines. What gives me hope is watching how people respond to this terrible climate disaster by planting trees, 
to regenerate the forest. The conviction, passion, and drive of our indigenous youth to reclaim stewardship over our homelands is what gives me hope in the face of climate change. The leadership and resilience of the indigenous communities and farmers we work with and their commitment to the protection of forests and biodiversity. It gives me hope that there is a convergence of awareness from the bottom up, from the community level, and from the top down, the government is finally putting money into serious adaptation projects that will protect or help in the resilience of communities. Seeing my fellow Kenyans taking action to change the world a little bit every day gives me hope. Farmers are now changing the way they grow and people who live near the forest are now aware that this is a precious resource we must protect. Each of us can contribute to the solution and we can each feel empowered that we are together creating the future that we actually want. You see, climate apathy is a privilege. As we just saw, the closer you get to the crisis, the more active people are. There's no room for apathy when you're responding to the crisis in real time. It's not a theory, it's reality. We're here to create a third space, a third space where the resources of wealthy countries and the global north and privileged individuals can support the complexity and richness of climate action on the front lines in the global south. This is what we mean when we say climate justice. Hold up, history lesson. Our current climate crisis is the result of a global economy built on a foundation of colonialism, which exports land, resources, and human labor, all for the benefit of a very small percentage of people, mostly in the global north. So now you know what the global north and the global south are. Okay, thanks, bye. You see, this hierarchy of global north versus global south still continues today in many ways, and it affects the international response regarding climate. We need to transcend the binary to address the climate change. There are so many proven solutions that already exist, and we have to tap into them all. Sustainability is a spectrum that should lead to regeneration and healing. Hello, all of the above. Hi, so many solutions exist. That doesn't seem overwhelming to you as an individual because I'm overwhelmed. No, because we each have a role to play. If you were born on this earth, you have a beautiful purpose, not just for your individual well-being, but also for our collective well-being. Each and every one of us has a choice. Do I want to make the world a better place? not just for future generations, but for all of us now. There are a multitude of proven climate solutions and we know they work. We just have to summon the political will and change our culture to make it happen. And each of us has a special superpower to contribute to this movement. What we're asking each of you is to consider this. Is your relationship to the climate crisis rooted in fear and scarcity or abundance and love? Because mother nature is the ultimate source of abundance and love. The climate apocalypse mentality is based on fear. They are completely different energetic frequencies. Acting from love is sustainable. Acting from fear leads to burnout. Which brings us to the million dollar question. The million dollar question remains, what is the most urgent solution? Is, is it, it A, B, C, D, E, F, or all of the above? Let's continue our journey together on all of the above TV. You're still here. Oh my God, you're still here? Wait, you're still here. Let's okay. meditate. Okay, let's do it. Everyone, close your eyes. Have your feet rooted into the ground, palms facing up. Take a deep breath in through your nose. Hold it here. Breathe it out through your mouth. Second breath in through your nose. Hold it here for two counts. Breathe out through your mouth. Last breath, in through your nose. Hold it here for three counts. Let it out with a big sigh out through your mouth. 
I want everyone to keep closing their eyes and start naming off everything that you love, every person, everything. Name who you love. Continue breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. You may open your eyes. So, to anyone name themselves or Mother Nature as someone they loved. If you didn't name yourself, you didn't name Mother Nature, that's where we have to start. We have to start with the love and the abundance. 